Several years ago, long ago, late 70s, uh, when I was only 16, uh, one night I dropped to my knees at the edge of the bathtub in the upstairs bathroom at a home in Littleton, Colorado. I felt nauseous, but not with the flu. It was the existential dread of Jean-Paul Sartre that he wrote about in his novels. I wondered if I was sane or insane, if there was a difference between the two, and why I would even care to ask the question in the first place. I was staring into the void. Did Nietzsche care when he announced that God was dead and went insane? Through tears, I said, Jesus, I don't think I can believe in you anymore. What had brought me to that point? Well, I suppose it was my love of science. I still love science. I suppose it was also my new youth pastor who helped me see that really nothing mattered more than, than faith. And I'm sure it was Mr. Roberts who was my 11th grade history teacher. Mr. Roberts kind of made his, it, his mission to attack the faith of all the Christian kids in his class. And I made it my mission to argue with Mr. Roberts. He had a slew of arguments, some okay, some just like utterly absurd. I remember him saying, Jesus came to destroy temple worship. Correct, Hyatt? And I'd say, um, uh, uh, I guess. And they'd say, well, then why did the disciples go back to the temple after the resurrection? Huh? See, it's all, it's all ridiculous, Hyatt. And I'd say, uh, uh, um. Fortunately, I had a dad with a philosophy degree from the University of Denver and a master's degree from Princeton Theological Seminary. And dad never seemed to be bothered by any of the arguments. And he helped me see the logical absurdities in most of the arguments. For Jesus, for instance, Jesus didn't just come to abolish uh, one temple, he came to build a, a new temple, and Mr. Roberts was unfamiliar with what Jesus was talking about, but still I'd sit in my room trying to prove the existence of God. You know, trying to make a car horn honk through, through prayer. Reading books on the Shroud of Turin, searching for irrefutable evidence and watertight proofs for the existence of, of God, that God did in fact exist. And I would read scripture. Sometimes it would thrill me. Often it would terrorize me. In Romans chapter 1 was like the worst. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Sometimes I, as a child, I had prayed and God seemed to answer. You know, like a stomachache would go away or I'd feel comforted. But this night I prayed and God did not seem at all plain to me and I felt forsaken. It was anything, anything but a wonderful world. And so I prayed, Jesus, I don't think I can believe in you anymore. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would teach us the difference between hell and heaven, between a dead world and a world full of wonder. I pray, Father, that you would preach the gospel to our hearts. In Jesus' name, to the power of your spirit, amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 27. This is our third uh, sermon in our series through the book of, of Romans. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. You remember that's unfaithfulness, what we learned last time, right? From faith to faith, the righteous uh, shall live by faith against all unrighteousness or unfaithfulness of men who hold the truth imprisoned in the chains of their unrighteousness. That's a rather literal translation by Karl Barth. 
which paints a kind of surprising picture. The truth, and you remember Jesus is the truth according to Scripture, the truth is imprisoned within all people, imprisoned in their unfaithfulness, their unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed, not against men, but the unrighteousness of men, which imprisons the truth within them, kind of like a spirit imprisoned in an old stone temple behind a curtain, or, or a breath imprisoned in a jar of clay. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain, is shown, is what it literally means, is shown to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, his invisible things, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the cosmos in the things that have been made, poema. Poema is this great Greek word, and it's where we get our English word poem. It only appears in one other place in all of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, when Paul writes, we are God's workmanship, his poema his poem. What can be known about God is shown to us in the poem. So they're without excuse, verse 20, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature or the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 19. What can be known about God is plain. It's obvious to them because God has shown it to them. Well, it was just a normal day, prepping food at an Italian restaurant, and it turned into a miracle when a line cook spotted that in a sliced eggplant. You see that? The seeds in that eggplant form the word God. Joining us now, the line cook who made that divine discovery is Jermarcus Brady. Hey, Jermarcus, good to see you this morning. Good to see you. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you. I want to hear the story. How did this all happen? Um, um, it was a normal day, just cutting and slicing and sauteing eggplants. Um, after sauteing, after cutting them, I put them in the, in the saute pan and the word was obvious in the plant. It was obvious in the plant, says Jermarcus, the line cook from Gino's restaurant in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That is exactly what I wanted that night by the bathtub in 1978. I wanted to cut open an eggplant and see the word, God. Well, Mr. Roberts, he would have said that Jermarcus was a liar with the latest version of, of Photoshop or he might have said, he might have said that the seeds just happened to spell God by chance. But what if every time you did slice open an eggplant, the seeds spelled God? Wouldn't we say, well, that's just the way all eggplants have evolved? And so we wouldn't read the word of God in the eggplant. Or what if every time we said a little prayer and then sliced the eggplant, the word God suddenly appeared in the eggplant? Wouldn't we conclude that we were God? Or at least that we had control of God, in which case God wouldn't really be God? Mad scientists and Pharisees, that is people who worship science or people that worship religion, can't read the word of God in the eggplant. At best, they might conclude that God exists, but they wouldn't know who he is or what he means. And so they end up worshiping themselves or the eggplant. The word God written in seeds in an eggplant is what I would call a sign. I don't think Jermarcus was seeking a sign, and yet he could read the sign. 
I'm guessing Jermarcus could read the sign because he'd already seen God in every eggplant he had sliced and heard God within himself, the poema. Well, I'm just wondering what Paul meant when he wrote, what can be known about God is plain to them, namely his eternal power and divine nature in the poema. Eternal power is the Greek term uh, aidios dynamis, or everlasting dynamite. Divine nature is the Greek word theotes, which comes from theos, which, you know, means God. And it's like the word theon that's translated divinity or brimstone. Aedios dynamis and theotes, clearly perceived in the poema ever since the creation of the cosmos. <laughs> when I was a kid, Carl Sagan was always on TV when it was show Cosmos, and he always started by saying this, the cosmos is all that is, was, or ever shall be. I had a friend who once sat in a meeting at Caltech with several other physicists and Carl Sagan, and Sagan was prefacing his comments for the morning with this famous line from TV when one of the other physicists interrupted him and said, Carl, stop, just stop. We're not your TV audience. We know that that's not true. It's not true. See, 100 years ago, most scientists thought that that was true, that matter, space, and time were all that is, was, or ever shall be. But 92 years ago, Edwin Hubble revealed that this was evidently not true. For in fact, the cosmos, that is, all of space and time, which would include all cause and in fact, which would in include all science and scientific analysis, the cosmos just sprang into existence 13.8 billion years ago as we measure time from the surface of the earth. In other words, everything temporal could only be explained by something atemporal, that is eternal. Everything natural could only be explained by something supernatural. Everything caused must have an uncaused cause. Now, that was an absolute shock for scientists. Most scientists, I should say. Some scientists, at least. But not a shock for philosophers. In the 5th century BC, Plato and Aristotle both posited an uncaused cause for the cosmos. In the 13th century AD, Thomas Aquinas cleaned up their argument, gave it back to the church. The cosmological argument, it goes like this, okay? Imagine the sum total of everything that is caused, all right? And now ask yourself, what caused everything that is caused? Well, that thing itself couldn't have a cause, or it would be part of the sum total of everything that was caused. It would necessarily be the uncaused cause. And Aquinas said, well, that's, that's God. And some people would say, well, that's not necessarily God, but it is necessarily aedios, which means everlasting or unchanging. Time is, is change. Cause and effect happen in time. So the uncaused cause is, must be the, uh, the cause of of time, the uncaused cause of, of time. Paul writes that God's power is aedios, that is lasting for all of time, and in Romans 16, he will refer to God as himself ionios, that is of the age, not only unchanging in time, but the unchanging source of all time, the creator of space-time. So scripture pictures the cosmos as something like an explosion of nothingness, within the somethingness that is God. And now scientists and philosophers point out that there must be something of that somethingness that we call God in the nothingness that is us. So if you didn't follow all that, follow this. In other words, there's something in people that is, well, just like the something beyond the Big Bang. If you get a chance, and you got YouTube, take a look at the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. 
They've done it over and over and over again. It's utterly terrifying and amazing and wonderful. Quantum physics is revealing that there's something in you more fundamental than matter or space-time. It is apparently aedios and ionios, like God. They call it consciousness. Are you conscious that I just said that? Consciousness? Philosophers and theologians, I think, call it spirit. There is an I that observes the thing that I call me. I exist in the eternal now, and the moment I observe I, I has become me, a thing in space and time. I am spirit, and I observe me in space and time, but I am not in space and time. I am aedios and ionios, it would seem. So if I say I am utterly sick of myself, which I do sometimes. But if I say I am utterly sick of myself, I cannot be the self that I'm sick of. I am somehow like the I am that speaks all things into existence. I am like the breath of God in the dust of space and time. I may be sick of the jar of clay in which I am trapped, but I am not the jar of clay in which I am trapped. I am something quite different. So anyway, back to our scripture. His iodios dynamis is perceived in the poema, the things that have been made, writes Paul. His iodios dynamis and his theotes, translated divine nature, divinity, or, or deity. Deity in the things that have been made, as if God is in the stuff that's all around you. Even eggplants. You know, in Scripture, there are these remarkable predicate nominative statements. You know what that is? A, this is that statement. This is that. And no one seems to take them seriously. For instance, 1 John 1, 5, God is light. And I am the light of the world, said Jesus in John 8, 12. John 14, 6, he says, I am the truth. Or how about this one? 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Some would say, well, okay, right, God is love, but that doesn't mean that all love is God. Well, what love could possibly be not God? Only love that is somehow a lie about love, right? A lie about God. God is love, and there is a word of God which became flesh. Jesus is the word of God, logos of God, reason of God, the logic of God. How about this one? Jesus said, God alone is good. Jesus is not saying that God is good in the way that other things are good, but that God is the good, and so he is the goodness in everything that's anything, anything good, beautiful, pleasing, or excellent. That's what the word good, agathos in Greek means, the, the thing you like. God is the good, and his word Jesus is the life. Jesus said, I am, and, and I am in the way that Jesus said it in Greek. Ego, a me, is actually the name of God. God is amnes, or beingness. In him we live and move and have our being, says Paul to the Athenians. We're like fish in water, trying to talk about water. But God is, so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which implies that life, truth, and progress is I am that I am. That is God. So, is life, truth, beauty, love, and reason evident in the things that have been made? That's all that any of us ever talk about. So yeah. And yet, what are they? <laughs> right? No one seems to know. For instance, what's reason? What is the reason for reason? How can a scientist ever prove that reason is reasonable? Reason is like the unreasonable reason for everything that has a reason. 
like an uncaused cause. You must have faith in reason in order to reason. How could we possibly know that truth is true? See, we all know about truth, and we constantly argue about truth. That's the only thing we do argue about, but none of us can prove that truth is true. We all assume it's true and assume that everyone that's anyone knows truth, even if they themselves are untruthful. Or how about beauty? Beauty and good are often the same word in Greek and Hebrew. What is, what is beauty? We turn to our neighbor and say, that's beautiful, as if our neighbor knows what we're talking about, but no one can even come close to defining beauty. Beauty is like not a thing in this world, but almost like a, a voice from another, another world, another reality. Or how about love? I mean, real love is fascinating because it's like just the opposite of the survival of the fittest. It's the sacrifice of the fittest. It's a logic foreign to this world that seems to threaten us in this world, yet entices us in this world. It romances us in this world to a different kind of life. And what is life? Nobody, no one, can actually make it, only give birth to it. And it appears to be a community of sacrificial love in a world that constantly violates love and disrespects life. And why is life good? What is the good? We all assume that our neighbors know about the good, but it's not a thing in this world. It's like a message from another world, like a voice all around me that I can hear and understand in the depths of my soul. So I assume that you can hear it and somehow understand in the depths of your soul. So when I talk about the good, you know kind of what I'm talking about it. Uh, somehow I hear it in the depths of my soul, even if I can't make sense of it with my brain. This voice. When my firstborn son was born, he knew my voice. It's honestly one of the most startling and wonderful things that I have ever experienced. As I've told you, John was born five and a half weeks early after 24 hours of intense labor. He was born with a cone head, a black eye, a body full of bruises. Birth is painful. And Jonathan would not stop crying. He was just wailing. The doctors cut the cord, the cord that connected him to that old womb of a world. The nurses cleaned him up, wrapped him in a blanket, placed him in my arms, but still he would not stop crying. And then this nurse said to me, speak to him. He knows your voice. And I said, Scooter? Instantly he stopped crying. as if he knew that he was home. He knew my voice. How did he know my voice? He was literally, literally a piece of me, a seed of me, but he had never seen me, never touched me, and yet he knew my voice. How did he know my voice? Well, you know, he had heard it all those months in that womb which was his world, his cosmos. I had actually taken an indelible black magic marker and drawn a big smiley face on Susan's belly, and every night before bed, I'd talk to the smiley face. I'd say, Scooter? We called him Scooter because we didn't know if he was a boy or a girl. Yeah, I'd say, Scooter? Hope you're doing great in there. Can't wait to see you out here. I love you. Imagine when I spoke, everything in his world would move. It would literally vibrate to the sound of my voice. Physicists now argue that all creation is like vibrations of meaning in quantum fields or super strengths. I don't know if they're right, that's what they say. Scripture says that God speaks all things into existence and upholds all things with what? His word, vibrations in, in the atmosphere. The psalmist writes that all creation proclaims the glory of God, even, that would include eggplants, even eggplants. Well, I was just saying that I wasn't a thing in John's world. You couldn't find me in John's world. And I could not be explained by 
anything in John's world. And my voice, my word could not be explained by anything in John's world. Just like life, truth, beauty, love, and reason can't be explained by anything in this world, and yet everyone recognizes them in this world, so they must be like messages from another world. That is theotes, the voice of the divine. And the fact that we can recognize them in this world would indicate that we're being prepared for that other world, the Aedios world of our Father. Martin Luther noted that if a baby in the womb could reason, surely it would wonder, is there such a thing as a mom? Is there such a thing as a dad? What are these hands for? What are these feet for? What is this mouth for? Each of those things are useless in the womb world, and yet they each make life worth living in in this world. What is faith for? How come you find it everywhere in this world? What is faith for? What is consciousness for? Why are we conscious? What purpose does that serve? Perhaps faith is like consciousness of another consciousness. You know, spirit, calling to spirit in response to spirit, or as Paul put it, faith unto faith. A communion of spirit. Well, because Jonathan knew my voice in the womb world, he could rest in my arms in this world his home. It turns out that John's ears were made to hear my voice, and John's mouth was made to speak my name, to say, Daddy. I'd hold him in my arms, and I'd I'd speak. I'd say, say, Daddy, say, Daddy, say, Daddy, say, Daddy. The thrill of hearing my breath returning to me as the breath of my son as he said, Daddy, is indescribable. Spirit calling to spirit, faith unto faith. Romans 8, 15, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Paul then writes that this whole creation is groaning in travail, that is, birth pains, as if the entire creation is a womb giving birth to the sons and daughters of glory, which are us. Then Paul tells us that Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. We thought that he was dying, and it turns out he was being born. That's pretty cool. And like John tells us, Christ is the word of God He is the Word of God in human flesh. So pay attention. Jesus Christ is not only the way, the truth, the life, the light, the reason of God and the love of God. He is not only the aedias dynamis and the theates that can be plainly seen and heard vibrating in everything that's anything. He is the Word of God in human flesh that once walked the face of this earth, that once came and and walked in this womb of a world. And when he came to this womb of a world, we nailed him to a tree in a garden. Why? 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 Isn't it because we were jealous of him? That's what scripture says. Isn't it because we wanted to be good like him? And we wanted to be alive like him? Isn't it because we were intimidated by him, frustrated with him, wanted to conquer him, control him, utilize him? We wanted to know about him. Not as a person, but a thing. Not a a who, but a what. Like an idol. Like an idol. What if the word of God didn't just come to earth in 33 AD in Bethlehem? What if the unchanging and divine word of God has been coming to earth ever since the beginning and will be coming to earth until the end? What if the way we relate to him on the tree in the garden outside of Jerusalem is the way we relate to him every day in the sanctuary 
of our own soul. What if it's Jesus that hangs like fruit on the tree of life? And what if it's Jesus that hangs like fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Jesus is the good in flesh, and Jesus is the life. Think about that tree. What's hanging on the, on the tree? Well, that, that is the good, right? In human flesh, correct? What if you wanted the good in your human flesh? <laughs> That's the good in human flesh. When did you want the good in your human flesh? How could you get it? Well, you could take it and consume it like food. That's what Eve considered at the snake's suggestion. She thought that it was good for food and a delight to the eyes. Or maybe you could take it and use it to make yourself good. That's also what Eve considered the snake's suggestion, that it was to be desired to make one wise, like a law is to be desired to make one good. And yet a law is dead. You could take the life of the good like food or a law, or you could maybe receive the life of the good like a bride who receives her groom and gives birth to his life, the life of the good. Not a what, but a who. The good is on the tree. The life is on the tree. What is life to you? A thing to be conquered? Or a gift to be received? Not a what, but a who. The truth is on the tree. What is the truth to you? A thing to be conquered and twisted to serve you like a lie? Or a person to be followed at all costs like a Lord? Not a what, but a who. A who that knows you. Love is on the tree. What is love to you? A hormone? Some kind of psychological euphoric state, an ideal, a thing to be used like like a whore? or a person to die for, like a bride or a groom, not a what, but a who who knows you, fills you, and then animates you. God is on the tree. What is God to you? What is God to you? What can be known about love, truth, life, and beauty, or the beauty, truth, life, and love that knows you? Not a what, but a who, who now lives his life in and through you. It's fascinating, I think. If you go back and look at this story, that after Adam and Eve take the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden in chapter three, as God is sending them into exile, he says this, behold, the Adam, mankind, has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. They knew about God, right? Suddenly they knew about God, but they could no longer know God, they were dead and exiled from their own garden. What did Pilate, Herod, and the Romans and the Jews and all of us, what did all of us come to know the day we took the knowledge of God, we took the knowledge of God on the tree in the garden just outside of Jerusalem, didn't we come to know about God? That God is good and we're bad? Maybe evil? We came to know about God, but could no longer know God because we just took his life on a tree. And life is, according to Jesus, knowing him. So what can be known about God is that God is good. We are bad and dead and exiled from our own garden. Faith is not what can be known about God. Faith is God knowing you. And so faith never looks like arrogance. And it always looks like worship. Everyone knows about God. Even uh, atheists know about truth, or they wouldn't be arguing with you that they're true and you're not true. Everyone knows about God, but not all have allowed themselves to be known by God. Listen closely. This is Paul in 1 Corinthians 8. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Well, we all took the life of love on a tree in a garden and so came to know about love, but discovered we were unable to love, we were dead. But today, right now, 
we come back to the tree and discover that even before we took the life of love, love forgave his life to us, and that body broken and that blood shed is the promised eternal and imperishable seed. Faith is the life of love rising in us and making all things new. And that's why Jermarcus, the line cook, could read the eggplant. Mad scientists, scientists that worship science, because not all scientists are mad scientists, they're great scientists, but mad scientists, scientists that worship science, can't read the word in the eggplant. They'll find a ways to say that it's just chance or just the way that all eggplants are. They'll worship the eggplant <laughs> or themselves. Pilate sat right in front of the word of God and couldn't read him. He said to the truth, what is truth? And Jesus did not answer, except he himself is the answer. <laughs> Pharisees, that is religious folks that worship religion, can't read the word in the eggplant. They'll find a way to take credit for the word and then use the word to get others to worship them. The Pharisees said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. Then he gave them the sign that is himself, body broken and bloodshed. Jamarcus didn't have faith because he read the sign. If it really was a sign, Jamarcus read the sign because he already had faith. He had learned to walk by faith so the divine in him could recognize the divine all around him and in every eggplant. Jamarcus, if you watch the rest of the interview, is a father of four, and he says that the eggplant meant that although he cannot trust man, he can trust God, his father, in the midst of his tribulations, and so the eggplant was like a wink from his dad saying, I'm with you, Jamarcus. Keep going. Just keep going. Well, I don't know if we can trust Jamarcus or Aristotle and the cosmological argument or Anselm and the ontological argument or Aquinas and the teleological argument or C.S. Lewis and the moral argument, but I do think that Truth whispers in your soul. I think beauty calls to you through flowers and little babies. The life talks to you and walks with you through the valley of the shadow and the good, the good reveals himself in the void that is evil. And I think you can trust him in the sanctuary of your own soul. You can believe because he believes in you within you. I love this cartoon. Have you found Jesus? You see him? He's hiding behind the curtain in the living room. And that's actually rather profound, for Jesus taught us that each one of us is a temple. And in the temple there is a curtain, and behind the curtain is the aedias dunamis and theotes, the breath of God and the Spirit of God. He whispers, seek me, me, and you will find me. And so I stared into the insanity of, insanity of Nietzsche, who announced that God is dead, and I felt Sartre's nausea, for if Truth, beauty, life, and love are dead, then everything is absolutely nothing. And then I said, Jesus, I don't think I can believe in you anymore. Then I went to bed. In the morning, I began to seek, not because I thought I should believe, but because I wanted to believe in him. And so I sought him, him who is always seeking me. Decades later, I mean, it really was decades later that it occurred to me that when I said, Jesus, I don't think I can believe in you anymore, I was talking to the one that I thought I didn't believe in. See, he must have been whispering to me from behind the curtain. And now I should say that I have had and by the way, all those philosophers, all that stuff, it all helped. But I, but I should also say that I've had so many crazy experiences. And I'm meaning demons, angels, healings, um, signs and wonders. 
God even pinning me to the floor. I've had so many wild experiences now that, that I cannot help but believe that God exists. And yet I know that I still struggle to believe just how much he loves me. See, God doesn't seem to be too worried about whether or not I believe that he exists. But he seems to be incredibly concerned that I would want him to exist. That I would come to trust that he is infinitely good to me. He suffers absolutely everything, everything I suffer. The sufferings I inflict on others, he suffers. The sufferings of this entire goddamned world. He suffers them all to get me to trust his heart. And so each week, each day, indeed every moment, his eternity touches my time. As he takes bread and he breaks it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he takes the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Eat of it. Drink of it, Peter. When I trust him in this, the gospel, every eggplant is wonderful. (laughs) The whole world is wonderful. And I begin to think to myself, what a wonderful world. Almost as if the kingdom of heaven really is at hand. Amen. So, Dad, <laughs> your name is I am Yahweh. And Jesus. Your name is Yahweh is salvation. I am salvation. And what am I? God, to me, in some ways, that's become the greatest mystery. Whatever I am, I am observing my own creation. And Lord God, you are good, and you do not fail. You are all around me, and you have established your throne in the sanctuary of my heart. And so I surrender this temple to you. We surrender our temple to you. And then, Lord God, this really is a wonderful world. Forgive me for trapping you in the dungeon of my fear. And thank you from rising from the tomb that was my heart. God, you really are good. And nothing can compare. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We praise you. Amen. Hey, uh, next week, um, we're going to be preaching about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And homosexuality. And heterosexuality. And your sexuality. And everything that might embarrass you. So I'm just giving you a warning, and I hope you come, okay? So uh, anyway, you could be praying about that, and we'll see you next week. But uh, right now, believe the gospel, and may you have a wonderful day. Amen.